Hey everybody, this is Sheets, and I hope everybody had a good weekend. We're going to do an early look at the NHL slate for this evening. I hope to be live a little bit later to go over it again. Um, all we have tonight is this and the uh, NFL showdown slate, so I'm trying to coordinate my schedule to make this work. Uh, nonetheless, uh, for those of you who want to get an early look and more to the point, people who want to learn how to uh, engage in a process to build lineups in the future, um, as they say, you come to the right place. Uh, what we're going to do is we're first going to take a look at the team totals, see who we expect to be the top teams. Then we are going to look at my sheets um, and see who looks like the best players and try to figure out who we would instinctively put in our lineups and then build the lineup like that. And then we'll go back into Saberson and build a portfolio of lineups just kind of based on our projections. And then finishing it off, we are going to build a set of lineups that are specifically tailored to the contests that we are entering tonight. Um, so let's just start from the beginning. There's a five, uh, five teams, a uh, five game slate. And just looking at the uh, assumed team totals here, you'll see the Rangers at a 3.9 and Toronto at a 3.9 rate to be the two teams that tend to score the most goals and, you know, uh, exhibit 1A or, or point 1A is that goals being scored correlates usually really nicely to fantasy points. Does it always work that way? But almost always. And also, you know, High goal scores lead to high fantasy points for the individual players. And this is nothing new, but we're just kind of, again, just taking a really top-down approach. So we're expecting the best fantasy plays to be coming from Toronto and the Rangers. Will they all fit in your lineups? Maybe, maybe not. Will they be too highly owned? Maybe, maybe not. But we're, we're going to get to that. Um, so expecting to see a lot of Rangers and a lot of Torontos, Let's go into my actual sheets and see what it actually looks like. So again, to remind everybody, players over here, uh, fantasy points over here, points per dollar over here, ownership over here, and the key column to, to feed off of is sheets value score in column G. That's how we rate players with a combination of fantasy points and, and point per dollar. Um, here's even strength line, power play line. We're going to get to that in a minute. But what we're trying to do is, is again, take that, you know, 10,000 foot view and see which players, you know, that are rated really high, uh, are on the same team and, and, and to be even greedier, which of them are also on the same lot. I mean, if you find good players that rate really well, according to column G and are on the same line, those are usually good plays. And, and that's, you know, that's where you start. So when you just kind of stare at this right off the bat, you see just, bam, these three Toronto guys. Um, you have three Toronto guys out of the top four as the top plays. So then you have Mitchell Marner, who rates uh, in the top eight. So you have one, two, three, four Toronto guys right there. So it doesn't take a genius to figure out what you're supposed to do here. Um, now, again, what you're supposed to do and what you actually do are different because what you're supposed to do is really what almost everybody else is going to want to do also, right? Because I'm not the only one that sees stuff like this. And that's how you balance ownership versus upside and things like that. And that's what makes this game fun. But we want to start with this, right? Toronto, Matthews, Tavares, Nylander, and Marner. And just to be greedy, are they on the same line? I mean... I think they're all on the same power play line, at least. And some of them are on one, some are on two as far as even strength line. But this is definitely what you want to lock in, right, if you can make it work. Now, let's take a look at some other things here. Um, the aforementioned Rangers, they look okay, but they're just rated a little bit lower. Okay, um, so we'll get back to that. Another thing I'd like to notice here are who the kind of the good value one-offs are. And one of them looks like Detroit. This guy, Daniel Sprung, uh, you know, it's, it's not the best that he's on the th third line, second power play line, but it is, you know, pretty reasonably decent value score. And maybe we want to use him in some one-offs. Um, 
then you have other cheap one-offs are, are Sean Dersey from Arizona. And you'll see that he's also going to be really highly owned, but, but, you know, to plug as, as a one-off that this makes a lot of sense. And also, as you know, it's, it's usually the case that we're trying to search for those defensemen to fill out your lineup anyway. So I think this is going to be a very, you know, re really useful play. Let's put it that way. The other thing to notice is that um, Jack Hughes for the devils, he rates really highly in, in those stacks, you would play Meyer and Nico Hersher again, but they kind of fall to Toronto. Uh, one last thing before we continue this build is it's also a good idea to think about the possibility of, of pairing these cheapos with other guys in their team. So kind of look and see. And Dylan Larkin actually is on the first power play line. So if you could make that work and then Brincat and Debrincat is on the first power play line as well. So if using Sprung you know, can get you to these guys as kind of a secondary stack that might make a lot of sense. And also uh, the Jersey, if there's another Arizona guy, that would be helpful, but I don't see any other Arizona guys in our top list at all. So what we're going to probably try to do is play the Toronto's and then either get like kind of a secondary Detroit stack or play some one-offs starting with the Detroit and the, uh, and that um, gentleman from Arizona, Sean Jersey. So let's uh, let's pull up a lineup and let's see if we can do that. You know, it's nice to be able to do that. Um, but before we start, we do have to put some kind of goalie in. And again, what I like to do is just find the cheapest goalie who rates well. Uh, that's not so great. Uh, Kemper, 7,600 maybe. And if we could spend up, we spend up. But So let's just start with that, with Kemper. I just hope he's not on a team that we want to stack against. Let's see. Uh, yeah, all right. we don't care about Calgary too much. All right, so let's put these guys in. Uh, let's see if we can do it. Toronto, uh, let's remind ourselves. It's like family food. Let's remind ourselves the wonderful answers that Jim gave us before. Uh, Matthews, Tavares, let's just put those in. And again, I don't know if we can even do this. Matthews, Tavares, and then Nylander, and then the fourth one was Marner, right? Okay. So can we do this? 3175 a man. The answer is probably not without getting really, really nasty. Okay. So like we could start, for example, with something like Jersey. I mean, we're gonna have to. And now you're at 3,100 a man, and it's not as if there's anything else that great up here? You know, let's let's look and see. In, the next guy under 4K that we can get is oh great it's from the team we're stacking against. Okay, well you know what you do have. I mean, you do have this Michael Rasmussen guy at 3K. Um, so you can do it because it's not the perfect pairing here. But if you pair Rasmussen with that other Detroit guy, uh. Who are we talking about? Oh, the Sprung? You still are going to run into trouble here, but let's just see what this looks like. Sprung? No, that's 2650, which is not going to work. We need like a flat 2K guy, which we don't get. So it looks as though that this four-man Toronto thing is just not going to work, which is rather troubling. Um, and then I know what's going to happen. You're going to run through Saberson. It's going to find a way to do it. So let's just, just work a little harder. Let's go down a little further into the value things. Oh, here's what you could do. Schmaltz. Oh, he's 5,100. Okay. Rasmussen we could play. He's looking down for whatever cheapos we can, we can get. And then Lafreniere for the Rangers. Let's just see really what we what we can afford here. Let's put Rasmussen in here. I, mean, I don't even think there is a 2300 guy. But if you could find a cheap Toronto, and then you could finish off, like let's let's think about this Detroit stack again. Okay. Let's think about this. So Detroit. You already have Sprong in there. 
who else in Detroit did we like? So Sprong, and then we could play Larkin. And then who's the next cheapo? And then Debrink had a 6,800. Uh, and then Perone. Okay, so Perone is a winger at 4,800. So we're trying to play the wings. So Perone and Rasmussen are both on the two. And then Larkin is 1-1. One, one. Sprong is just kind of our cheapo. So if we replace one Toronto guy with, like, say, Perone, I think it opens up a lot. So if we have to get rid of a Toronto guy, who would it be? I guess it would be Marner, right? He just rates the lowest. Um, so let's get rid of Marner. And then we play Perone. And now, now we're kind of in business. Okay. So now we could finish off. We could either do a four Toronto, three, uh, four Detroit, three Toronto, or a four Toronto, three Detroit, depending on what we do with defense. So who is the defenseman at Toronto for Toronto that I'm missing here? It's not on my list. Let's see. Um, let's do it by team. How about that? Team, Toronto, defenseman. Kling, ooh, Klingberg at 4,300. Or we could play Riley at 54. Let's play Klingberg, see what that looks like. And this literally almost works. We just got to go down a little bit as, as uh, a little bit uh, goalie. And then we're in business. So is there another goalie? That's, is there a goalie that's going to be... 7,300? I hope so. That would that would be nice. Let me just see. Let's see. Sort by position. Again, we don't even know who the starting goalies are yet. So. Let's just see. Let's see what we got. Uh, yeah. Sergei Bobrovsky, 7,300. I've heard of him. Or, or go back to our favorite, Mrazek. He was a gene. Oh, it's against Toronto. Crap. Uh, but Bronx against the Devils, that's good because the Devils are probably going to get some ownership. And they're also going to probably fire some shots off, which is good for us. And there you have it. Um, okay. Now what we want to do is we want to go into Saberson and let's see what lineups we can do with, with, with the help of, of the lineup builder that can filter all this stuff out for us. So again, we're going to do two things. One, we're going to build the lineups just kind of pure. Then we're going to apply them to the actual contest win. So um, let's first uh, build settings. We're not. We're going to build fit. We'll build fifty lineups. And the first thing I want to do is I want to upload the projections from TrueDFS. I have my own file here, but this is probably available to you online. Uh, excuse me, within TrueDFS, you could probably get this right on the Saberson template. Let's just see. Uh, so let's just we'll build 50 lineups and then what we're going to do is in the meanwhile i just want to show you i already entered the contest sim settings so what that does it puts like a name to the two contests i'm playing that would be the kick save on the top shelf what i did was i went in here and i entered information like what the contest size was how much for first in an attempt to give the system a little better, uh, some help in figuring out what lineups, what lineups to, to go best in this type of contest. Um, so we save those and the top shelf is a little smaller, 270 people. So we, we save that, you know, a little differently. So these, so we're going to look at it a couple of ways. First, we're just going to look at the raw results and you can look at your lineups in many different ways. I'll show you some examples. So here we've done nothing. This is just based on the Sabre score um, rating, which accounts for upside. Small slate, it's going to be between 10,000 and 50,000 people. Um, it's actually not 100% accurate. It should be 6,200. So let's – we'll make it here. And when you sort them this way – wow, look at that, Detroit. There it is. So team stacks – like fifty eight percent Detroit, fifty eight percent Toronto. Okay, so our instincts were right. Um, 
So at this point, you could just 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 upload these, and that would be okay. You know, there are things you could do to maybe make it a little more optimal. Like like one, you can maybe first of all, you can go to maybe Min Uniques two to kind of spread out your your risk a little bit, and you're still getting mostly Toronto and Detroit. Um, but then again, what you can utilize this contest sim thing where you can tailor your lineup specifically to the contest you're playing. So that's what we're doing now. We're going to put run contest sim. And this was the guy I missed, the, uh, the, the Morty, Moritz Sider. Well, they're paying more for these Detroit guys. They're not paying for, for the four-man Toronto. So they're basically doing a 5-2-1 here. And, and the Dursey, obviously, is going to probably can take a lot of money. Um, oh, there it is. This is almost like our lineup here. Okay, so now what we want to do is we want to rank these in, in different ways. So first, this is what the kick saved. Now, you could rate them. You could you could you could sort them by ROI, risk adjusted ROI, win rate. Um, I like to try risk adjusted ROI. And when you do that, it looks a lot different, doesn't it? Right. If you do it this way, you get no Toronto and only ten percent Detroit. Now, why do you, why would you imagine that would be? Okay, um, you can stop the video and answer, and I'll give you the answer in five seconds. And the answer is, is that what the contest simulation tool does is it takes into account who everybody else is likely to play. So it creates more leverage type lineups. It's not going to get you the lineups that are, and this is kind of hard to explain, but you're not going to get the lineups that are most likely to come in. Okay. Because usually the most likely lineups to come in are owned by the most number of people. And so what it's looking for are lineups that have, okay chance to come in that's just not going to come not going to be owned by so many people so that's why when you take into account what tournament you're actually playing and actually apply it to a to a structure like a payout structure you get different different builds from what if you just kind of hand up you know or just even do a, an optimizer build even with upside when you don't factor in ownership so uh what i like to do is i i like to actually go with the um whatchamacallit go with the recommendation for the the mme builds with the exceptions i might give myself just a little you know of toronto and and, and um a little bit more of detroit just for the hell of it before i do anything i also want to check stack exposure so uh, a lot of just full on onslaughts, six zeros, four three five two. So I like that. So what I'm going to do is first I'm going to upload these. Let's save these to my to the uh, to the kick save. Place up there. Save. You see this thing jiggle here? That means that something changed. And then we'll go to the top shelf, which is the big buy-in, and, and that one I'm probably going to keep. Oops. Um, probably going to keep that the way it was. It's kind of like that. Yeah, so the kick save one is giving me more devils. I'm just going to keep keep it the way I have. So I'm not going to change that one. And if I was going to, I would, you know, I would I would manually change it. I'd put it up here like this. You know, save to my contest. I'll show you what I would do. Save to my contest. I would put it in top shelf and then just save. Okay, but I'm not going to do that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to download this. This is not all can't test been filled. That's fine. And then we'll go back into here, edit entries, upload, download, boom. So that's that's the one thing, the, not the one thing, but what's really been beneficial from the advent and the development of all these different contest simulation tools is that it's really given me you know a new not new but a continued continued improved outlook on the real difference between good plays good lineups and good lineups for the contest you're in and the reason why that's so interesting to me is this is exactly why i got a dfs because it's that's the question that i always struggle with or struggle with or grapple with with um in, in my in my portfolio management is that there's a difference right between first of all what a good company is Second of all, whether that company represents a good stock, those are not always the same. And then, and then 
if something's a good stock, does that mean that it's a well-valued stock? Okay, that's that's the third thing. And that's not even it. Just because if it's a well-valued stock, does it mean that it goes in a portfolio exactly the way you want? You know, like if you have 10 stocks that all look like good stocks, but let's just say they're all from the same industry, then you're not really doing the right thing by putting all those stocks in a portfolio because they're all going to be moving on sort of the same information. You know, if there's good news in an industry, most most often everything else in that same industry will kind of get dragged along. So just because you have 10 good stocks doesn't mean that they all flow together well in a portfolio. Um, and then, you know, even if, you know, let's say you have 10 good stocks and they go together in a portfolio, does that match the risk level that that portfolio is designed to accept? Right? If I have 10 stocks that all look good and they all you know, tend to like work well together, but they just have really, really high data and quite a bit of variance to them, that might be a good portfolio for someone with a huge you know, risk tolerance and, and big, you know, a big time horizon. But that portfolio of really, really good stocks that work well together and a good correlation, whatever, might not be appropriate for someone a little bit older that, that has a, a lower risk tolerance. And, and it goes the other way. Like if you have 10 good stocks that all are that work well together, good value, whatever, and but they're just too consistent, right? They don't have a wide range of outcomes. Even those portfolios are not particularly appropriate for for your low for your uh, for your high risk uh, 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 investors with, with with large time runs. You're doing them a disservice by giving them the lower beta, more consistent stocks. Now it doesn't take too much of a leap to figure out how that applies to DFS, right? I mean, if you find a good lineup of players that correlate well and all that stuff but they have like a very, very low range of outcomes. Like if they're going to hit their median a lot, that's a really, really good lineup for like a cash game or for, you know, for a low risk con contest. But even that type of lineup is not appropriate for a lineup where you need to, where, where, where you're looking for more variance. Okay. So uh, I didn't expect to dive into the stock market analogy, but that is the reality. And that's what I kind of like about this. Anyway, uh, that should do it. We'll we'll go back to um, probably do a live lineup build um, closer to lock, and that should do it. Uh, good luck, everybody.